5. Human Capital, Formation in India Alfred Marshall The wisdom of expending public and private funds on education is not to be measured by its direct fruits alone. It will be profitable as a mere investment to give the masses of people much greater opportunities than they can generally avail themselves of. For by this means many would who would have died unknown are unable to get the start needed for bringing out their latent abilities. After studying this chapter, the learners will understand the concepts of human resource, human capital formation and human development, the links between investment in human capital, economic growth and human development, the need for government spending on education and health, the state of India's educational attainment. Introduction Think of one factor that has made a great difference in the evolution of mankind. Perhaps it is the man's capacity to store and transmit tra- knowledge which has been doing through conversation, through songs and through elaborate lectures. But man soon found out that we need a good deal of training and skill to do things efficiently. We know that the labor skill of an educated person is more than that of an undereducated person and hence the former is able to generate more income than the latter and his contribution to economic growth is consequently more. Education is sought not only as it confers higher earning capacity on people but also for its other highly valued benefits. It gives one a better social standing and pride. It enables one to make better choices in life. It provides knowledge to understand the changes taking place in society. It also stimulates innovations. Moreover, the availability of educated labor force facilitates adoption of new technologies. Economists have stressed the need for expanding educational opportunities in a nation as it accelerates the development process. What is a human capital? Just as a country can turn physical resources like land into physical capital like factories, similarly it can also turn human resources like nurses, farmers, teachers, students into human capital like engineers and doctors. Societies need sufficient human capital in the first place, in the form of competent people who have themselves been educated and trained as professors and other professionals. In other words, we need good human capital to produce other human capital. This means that we need investment in human capital to produce more human capital out of human resources. Let us understand a little more of what human capital means by posing the following questions. What are the sources of human capital? Is there any relation between human capital and economic growth of the country? Is the formation of human capital linked to man's all-round development, as it is now called human development? What role can the government play in human capital formation in India? Sources of human capital Investment in education is considered as one of the main sources of human capital. There are several other sources as well investments in health, on the job training, migration and information are the other sources of human capital formation. Why do your parents spend money on education? Spending on education by individuals is similar to spending on capital goods, by companies with the objective of increasing future profits over a period of time. Likewise, individuals invest in education with the objective of increasing their future income. Like education, health is also considered as an important input for the development of a nation as much as it is important for the development of an individual. Who can work better, a sick person or a person with sound health? A sick labourer without access to medical facilities is compelled to abstain from work and there is loss of productivity. Hence, expenditure on health is an important source of human capital formation. Preventive medicine vaccination, curative medicine, intervention during medical intervention during illness, social medicine 
and provision of clean drinking water and good sanitation are the various forms of health expenditures. Health expenditure directly increases the supply of healthy labor force and is thus a source of human capital formation. Firms spend on giving on the job training to their workers. This may take different forms. 1. The workers may be trained in the firm itself under the supervision of a skilled worker. 2. The workers may be sent for off-campus training. In both these cases, firms incur some expenses. Firms will thus insist that the workers should work for a specific period of time after their on-the-job training during which it can recover the benefits of the enhanced pr productivity owing to the training. Expenditure regarding on-the-job training is a source of human capital formation as the return of such expenditure in the form of enhanced labour productivity is more than the cost of it. People migrate in search of jobs that fetch them higher salaries than what they may get in their native places. Unemployment is the reason for the rural-urban migration in India. Technically, qualified persons like engineers and doctors migrate to other countries because of higher salaries that they may get in such countries. Migration in both these cases involves cost of transport, higher cost of living in the migrated places and psychic cost of living in a strained social-cultural setup. The enhanced earnings in the new place outweigh the cause of migration, hence expenditure on migration, is also a source of human capital formation. People spend to acquire information relating to the labour market and other markets like education and health. For example, people want to know the level of salaries associated with various types of jobs, whether the educational institutions provide the right type of employable skills and at what cost. This information is necessary to make decisions regarding investments in human capital as well as for efficient utilization of the acquired human capital stock. Expenditure incurred for acquiring information relating to the labor market and other markets is also a source of human capital formation. Box 5.1 Physical and Human Capital both the terms of capital formation are outcomes of conscious investment decisions. The decision regarding investment in physical capital is taken on the basis of one's knowledge in this regard. The entrepreneur possesses knowledge to calculate the expected rates of return to a range of investments and then rationally decides which one of the investments should be made. The ownership of physical capital is the outcome of the conscious decision of the owner. The physical capital formation is mainly an economic and technical process. A substantial part of the human capital formation takes place in one's life when she or he is unable to decide whether it would maximize her or his earnings. Children are given different types of school education and health care facilities by their parents and the society. The peers, educators and society influence the, in the decisions level. Moreover, the human capital formation at this stage is dependent upon the already formed human capital at the school level. Human capital formation is partly a social process and partly a conscious decision of the possessor of the human capital. You know that the owner of a physical capital, say a bus, need not be present in the place where it is used, whereas a bus driver who possesses the knowledge and ability to drive the bus should be present when the bus is used for transportation of the people and materials. Physical capital is tangible and can be easily sold in the market like any other commodity. Human capital is intangible. It is endogenously built in the body and mind of its owner. Human capital is not sold in the market, only the service of the human cap capital to be present in the place of production. Only the service of the human capital are sold and hence these arises the necessity of the owner of the human capital to be present in the place of the production. The physical capital is separable from its owner whereas human capital is inseparable from its owner. The two forms of capital differ in terms of mobility across space. Physical capital is completely mobile between countries 
except for some artificial trade restrictions. Human capital is not perfectly mobile between countries as movement is restricted by nationality and culture. Therefore, physical capital formation can be built even though even through imports, whereas human capital formation is to be done through conscious policy form formulations in consonance with the nature of the society and the economy and expenditure by the state and the individuals. Both forms of capital depreciate with time, but the nature of depreciation differs between the two. Continuous use of machines lead to depreciation and change of technology makes its machine obsolete. In the case of human capital, depreciation takes place with aging but can be reduced to a large extent through continuous investment in education, health, etc. This investment also facilitates the human capital to cope with change in technology, which is not the case with physical capital. Nature of benefits flowing from human capital are different from that of physical capital. Human capital benefits not only the owner but also the society in general. This is called external benefit. An educated person can effectively take part in democratic process and contribute to the socio-economic progress of a nation. A healthy person by maintaining personal hygiene and sanitation stops the spread of contagious diseases and epidemics. Human capital creates both private and social benefits whereas physical capital creates only private benefit. That is, benefits from a capital good flow to those who pay the price for the product and services produced by it. Human capital and economic growth. Who contributes more to the national income, a worker in a factory or a software professional? We know that the labor skill of an educated person is more than that of an uneducated person and that the former generates more income than the latter. Economic growth means the increase in real national income of a country. Naturally, the contribution of the educated person to economic growth is more than that of illiterate person. If a healthy person could provide uninterrupted labor supply for a longer period of time, then health is also an important factor for economic growth. Thus, both education and health, along with many other factors like on-the-job training, job market information and migration increase and individuals income generating capacity. This enhanced productivity of human beings or human capital contributes substantially not only towards increasing labor productivity but also stimulates innovations and create ability to absorb new technologies. Education provides knowledge to understand changes in society and scientific advancements thus facilitate inventions and innovations. Similarly, the availability of educated labor force facilitates adaptation to new technologies. Empirical evidence to prove that increase in human capital causes economic growth is rather nebulous. This may be because of measurement problems. For example, education measured in terms of years of schooling, teacher-pupil ratio and en enrollment rates may not reflect the quality of education, health services measured in monetary terms. Life expectancy and mortality rates may not reflect the true health status of the people in a country. Using the indicators mentioned above, an analysis of improvement in education and health sectors and growth in real per capita income in both developing and developed countries shows that there is convergence in the measures of human capital but no signs of convergence of per capita real income. In other words, the human capital growth in developing countries has been faster but the growth of per capita real income has not been that fast. There are reasons to believe that the casualty between human capital and economic growth flows in either directions, that is, higher increase, higher income causes building of high level of human capital and vice versa. That is, high level of human capital causes growth of income. India recognized the importance of human capital in economic growth long ago. The seventh five-year plan says human resources development has necessarily to be assigned a key role in any development strategy, particularly in a country with a large population, trained and educated 
on sound lines a large population can itself become an asset in accelerate accelerating economic growth and ensuring social change in desired directions it is difficult to establish a relation of cause and effect from the growth of human capital to economic growth that we but we can see that these sectors have grown simultaneously growth in each sector probably has reinforced the growth of every other sector the draft national education policy states that india aspires to take its place beside the united states and china as the third largest economy by 2030 to 32 india is the sixth largest economy now and we will reach 5 trillion economy in 5 7 years taking us to fourth or fifth position by 2030 to 32 we will be the third largest economy at over 10 trillion our 10 trillion economy will not be driven by natural resources but by knowledge resources we have not looked ahead into implications of being the world's third largest economy it will be a totally different environment ecosystems force us to think differently and achieving this milestone will have ramifications all across the country are we ready to take up this besides the us and the china as the top 3 largest economies of the world and be confident of sustaining it in the following years to do this we will need a knowledge society based on a robust education system with all the requisite attributes and characteristics in the context of changes in knowledge demands technologies and the way in which society lives and works this policy vision suggests how human capital formation in india will move its economy to a higher growth trajectory human capital and human development the two terms sound similar but there is a clear distinction between them human capital considers education and health as a means to increase labor productivity human development is based on the idea that education and health are integral to human well-being because only when people have the ability to read and write and the ability to lead a long and healthy life they will be able to make other choices which they value human capital treats human beings as a means to an end the end being the increase in productivity in this view any investment in education and health is unproductive if it does not enhance output of goods and services in the human development perspective human beings are ends in themselves human welfare should be increased through investments in education and health even if such investments do not result in high higher labor productivity therefore basic education and basic health are important in themselves respective of the contribution to labor productivity in such a view every individual has a right to get basic education and basic health care that is every individual has a right to be illit- to be literate and lead a healthy life box 5.2 india as a knowledge economy the indian software industry has been showing an impressive record over the past two decades entrepreneurs bureaucrats and politicians are now advancing views about how india can transform itself into a knowledge based economy by using information technology there have been some instances of villages using email which are cited as examples of such transformation likewise e-governance is being projected as the way of the future the value of it depends greatly on the existing level of economic development do you think it based services in rural areas will lead to human development state of human cap- capital formation in india in this section we are going to analyze human capital formation in india we have already learned that human capital formation is the outcome of investment in education health and the on job training migration and information of these education and health are very important sources of human capital formation we know that india is a federal country with a union government state governments and local governments municipalities and village panchayats the constitution of india mentions the functions to be carried out by each level of government accordingly expenditures on board education and health are to be carried out simultaneously by all the three tiers of the government analysis of health sector is taken up in chapter 8 
Hence, we will analyze only the education sector here. Do you know who takes care of the education and health in India? Before we take up the analysis of the education sector in India, we will look into the need for government intervention in education and health sectors. We do understand that education and health care services create both private and social benefits. This is the reason for the existence of both private and public institutions in the education and health service markets. Expenditures on education and health make substantial long-term impact and they cannot be easily reversed. Hence, government intervention is essential. For instance, once a child is admitted to a school or health care centre where the required services are not provided, before the decision is taken to shift the child to another institution, substantial amount of damage would have been done. Moreover, individual consumers of these services do not have complete information about the quality of services and their cost. In this situation, the providers of education and health services acquire monopoly power and are involved in exploitation. The role of government in this situation is to ensure that the private providers of these services adhere to the standards stipulated by the government and change and charge the correct price. In India, ministries of education at the union and state levels, departments of education and various organizations like National Councils of Educational Research and Training, NCERT, University Grants Commission, UGC, and All India Council of Technical Education, AICTE, facilitate institutions which come under the education sector. Similarly, the Ministries of Health at the Union and State level Departments of Health and various organizations like National Medical Commission and Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, facilitate institutions which come under the health sector. In a developing country like India, with a large section of the population living under below the poverty line, many people cannot afford to access basic education and health care facilities. Moreover, a substantial section of India's population cannot afford to reach super speciality health care and higher education. Furthermore, when basic education and health care is considered as a right of the citizens, then it is essential that the government should provide education and health services free of course for the deserving citizens and those from the socially oppressed classes. Both the union and the state governments have been stepping up expenditures in the education sector over the years in order to fulfill the objective of, at of attaining 10% literacy and considerably increase in the average educational attainment of Indians. Education sector in India Growth in government expenditure on education do you know how much the government spends on education? This expenditure by government is expressed in two ways. One, as a percentage of total, total government expenditure. Two, as a percentage of gross domestic product GDP. The percentage of education expenditure of total government expenditure indicates the importance of education in the scheme of things before the government. The percentage of education expenditure of GDP expresses how much of people's income is being committed to the development of education in the country. During 1952 to 2014, education expenditure as percentage of total government expenditure increased from 7.92 to 15.7 and as percentage of GDP increased from 0 0.64 to 4.13. Throughout this period, the increase in education expenditure has not has not been uniform and there has been irregular rise and fall. To this, if we include the private expenditure incurred by individuals and by philanthropic institutions, the total education expenditure should be higher. Elementary education takes a major share of total education expenditure and the share of higher or tertiary education learning like colleges, polytechnics and universities is the least, though on an average the government spends less on tertiary education, expenditure per student in tertiary education is higher than that of el elementary. This does not mean that financial resources should be transferred from tertiary education to elementary education.
As we expand school education, we need more teachers who are trained in the higher educational institutions. Therefore, expenditure on all levels of education should be increased. In 2014 to 15, the per capita public expenditure by on elementary education differs considerably across states from as high as rupees 34,651 in Himachal Pradesh to as low as rupees 4,088 in Bihar. This leads to differences in educational opportunities and attainments across states. One can understand the inadequate inadequacy of the expenditure on education if we compare it with the desired level of education expenditure as recommended by various commissions about 55 years ago the education commission had recommended that at least 6% of gdp be spent on education so as to make a noticeable rate of growth in educational achievements the tapas majumdar committee appointed by the government of india in 1999 estimated an expenditure of rupees 1.3 lakh 37 lakh crore over 10 years 1998 to 1999 to 2006 to 2007 to bring all indian children in the age of 6 to 14 years under the purview of school education compared to this desired level of education expenditure of around 6% of gdp the current level of a little over 4% has been quite inadequate in principle a goal of 6% needs to be reached this has been accepted as a must for the coming years in 2009 the government of india enacted the right of children to free and compulsory education act to make free education a fundamental right for all children in the age of 6 to 14 years government of india has also started levying a 2% education cess on all union taxes the revenues from education says has been earmarked for spending on elementary education in addition to this the government sanctions a large outlay for the promotion of higher education and new loan schemes for students to pursue higher education educational achievements in india generally educational achievements in a country are indicated in terms of adult literacy level primary primary education completion rate and youth literacy rate these statistics for the last two decades are given above future prospects education for all still a distant dream do literacy rates for both adults as well as youth have increased still the absolute number of illiterates in india is as much as india's population was at the time of independence In 1950 when the constitution of India was passed by the constituent Fam- assembly it was noted in the directive principles of the constitution that the government should provide free and compulsory education for all children up to the age of 14 years within 10 years from the commencement of the constitution had we achieved this we would have 100% literacy by now gender equity better than before The differences in literacy rates between males and females are narrowing signifying a positive development in gender equity still the need to promote education for women in India is imminent for various reasons such as improving economic independence and social status of women and also because women education makes a favorable impact on fertility rate and healthcare of women and children therefore we cannot be complacent about the upward movement in the literacy rate and we have miles to go in achieving 100% adult literacy higher education a few takers the indian education pyramid is steep indicating lesser and lesser number of people reaching the higher education level moreover the level of unemployment among educated youth is the highest as per nsso data in the year 2011 to 12 the rate of unemployment among youth males who studied graduation and above in rural areas was 19% their urban counterparts had relatively less level of unemployment at 16% the most severely affected ones were young rural female graduates as nearly 30% of them are unemployed in contrast to this only 3 to 6% of primary level educated youth 
in rural and urban areas are unemployed. The situation is yet to improve as indicated by the Periodic Labour Force Survey 2017-18. to Therefore, the government should increase allocation for higher education and also improve the standard of higher education institutions so that the students are imparted employable skills in such institutions. When compared to less educated, a large proportion of educated persons are unemployed. Why? Conclusion The economic and social benefits of human capital formation and human development are well known. The union and state governments in India have been earmarking substantial financial outlays for development of education and health sectors. The spread of education and health services across different sectors of society should be ensured so as to simultaneously attain economic growth and equity. India has a rich stock of scientific and technical manpower in the world. The need of the hour is to be better it qualitatively and provide such conditions so that they are utilized in India. A recap. Investment in education convert human beings into human capital. Human capital represents enhanced labor productivity which is an acquired ability and an outcome of deliberate investment decisions with an expectation that it will increase future income sources. Investment in education, on-the-job training, health, migration and information are the sources of human capital formation. The concept of physical capital is the base of conceptualizing human capital. There are some similarities as well as dissimilarities between the two forms of capital formation. Investment in human capital formation is considered as efficient and growth enhancing. Human development is based on the idea that education and health are integral to human well-being because only when people have the ability to read and write and the ability to lead a long and healthy life will they be able to make other choices which they value. The percentage of expenditure on education of the total government expenditure indicates the importance of education in the scheme of things for the government. End of chapter 5